having a comparison around dice is suspension, which is just popping out. It's so nice. I have a small little parish down by the airport. It's called Sacred Park. It's mostly, um, mostly Hispanic. It's a very bilingual parish. We have two. That's a little parish. It's, it's, those are my go-to guys. It's awesome. We just uh, went through what you guys are going through now with renovations, except we were poor, and so we did it ourselves. And so, <laughs> aren't you lucky that you're not in my men's group? As we, you know, I mean, one night we were up till midnight doing the, you know, the texture of the, of the roof because we had to cut and the lights and things like that. It was awesome. And those guys coming to the church, they, they say, this is, this is my home, this is my place. Um, so I want to talk about, you know, Bill said, talk, talk about the document. Um, you know, the main question of the document, what, is, what does it mean to be a man? What does it mean to be a Catholic man? What does masculine love and fatherhood? I think it kind of zeroed in, in, in one particular line in the, in the document, um, which, uh, which I'll, I'll get to. Um, but first I want to ask you a question. Just, just think about this. Um, in your life, uh, what man has had the greatest impact? Doesn't mean the best or the most possible. Just who's, what man has impacted you most? Just consider that that man or two men or whoever that is. Just consider that right now. I think we could say in God's providence, His plan, um, He brings us together. We're, we're, we're social by nature. He brings us together and we impact each other. And He has plans that, that some impact others, right? <clears throat> and so that um, that man in your life was, was most impacting. For, for many of us, it's our Father. We can't really avoid that. Um, but what if that man that was most impacting was you know, what if, what if he was a saint? What if he, what if he was present perfectly, affirmed you perfectly, present, uh, loving perfectly, you know, truthful, honorable, integrity, integr all those masculine virtues? If he had that perfectly, he'd probably be a different man. What if he was completely dysfunctional and couldn't, because of sin and struggle and human weakness, couldn't? give you much of anything, but still it impacted you how, how different you would be. Now, I think it's fair to say that all of us are somewhere in between those two, right? Think about that. You say, what if, we could, we could say, well, what if that, that man in my life, maybe my dad, what if he was the same? What if he was perfect? He was steadfast moment in the end. <clears throat> Some of our dads were close to that. We could say, what if my dad, um, what if he didn't live? What if, what if, or what if he abandoned me? how impacted I would be. And my point is, is that the man makes a difference. The man makes a difference. You're a different man because of whoever that was. And um, you, whatever's good is probably is coming from other, other men. I did a, three summers ago, um, I did a 30-day sound retreat. Went out to a hermitage out in the woods, and I had a spiritual director, and there was a few other priests on the retreat, but we didn't talk. Just 30 days with the Lord. St. Ignatius of Loyola to come up with this retreat a few hundred years ago. And um, in this retreat, in this silence, you turn off all the noise, nothing, no email, nothing, just nothing. Me and the Lord, and I had a little chapel in the little hermitage where I was. I spent a lot of time in adoration, just time with God. And I noticed in the first few days a flood of relationships and memories and thoughts and experiences. They all came in. And it just kind of like sat. And that's my humanity. That's, that's who I am. And then I noticed toward the end of the retreat, the great realization was, oh, <clears throat> if it wasn't for my dad and my mom as well, I wouldn't be who I am. And most especially my dad. Like, I just, I just learned throughout my 30s that I'm just my, just my dad's son. And that I am who I am because, because of him. And I share that uh, because I think that's the sense of a lot of us. We always say, well, I'm becoming my dad, right? 
I think we hear our dads are a mixed bag. Tomorrow's gospel is the weeds and the wheat. It's all of us, right? And they're all mixed together. We can't like uproot the weeds. And we can't imagine that they're not there. But it's, it's the reality. Our dads are a mixed bag. And we are kind of a product of them. My own dad has one memory of his father. One memory. He remembers his dad sitting at the table. He's told us many times, sitting at the table, eating breakfast. And he was a three-year-old boy. And his dad, soon after died of pneumonia, left behind his wife and five kids. And the wife had to raise the kids, and she worked very hard. But my dad, who I believe to be a great, it was a great dad, I kind of say, well, who was that man that impacted him? After my dad passed away, I went through his letters. In fact, I just did this in January. And I came across articles about a Christian brother that were teaching order of a man uh, in New York City. And an article about this one particular brother. And then with that, was photocopies of it and photocopies of the letters my dad wrote to him. Because this man stepped into the breach and took on a fatherly role and said, hey, I see this guy. He doesn't have his dad. And with discipline. Had it provided something. It's in us. Uh, masculinity and fatherhood, as, as men, we're so bound up, tied up into the other men that, that, that affect us. And as a vocation director, which means I prepare the men to become priests, there's a reason why it happens among men. Here, go to this school with 150 guys and work out your masculinity. And with some older men and priests to give examples and guidance and to walk with them. Greatness happens among men. It's, it's part of us. It's part of who we are. Um, and Bishop Olmsted, who to the breach, really kind of nailed it. He, he hit that on the head. I want to just start. Uh, I haven't started yet. I'm just starting now. <laughs> <laughs> in case you haven't noticed. Uh, I, I'm going to start. Uh, I want to start with just a little bit of philosophy because I think we're, we're in a world where, where a certain philosophy is affecting us. And if we listen for it, and we make the choice between these two philosophies, our lives will be very different. There is, on one hand, uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, enlightenment, or enlightenment, if we're honest. And he said that uh, the man is not very, is not rational. He's isolated. He's actually, essentially completed this set in himself. He determines what's true and what's not true. Gentlemen, that is dangerous. But that is very prevalent. That philosophy is prevalent in our, in our world. Following him is David Hume, who says that reason should be the slave of passions, which is to say, make truth conform to my, my own whatever my thoughts are. So this philosophy says, truth is not out there, I don't discover it, I don't observe it in nature, it's in me. I'll determine what's true or not. The extreme case is somebody who says, I'm a giraffe. I'm saying, no you're not. Oh yes I am, I determine that. That's the philosophy, take the philosophy to it and say, that's what you have. And in our day, we have it where we determine I'm a man or I'm a woman. And with no regard, for looking at nature and saying, actually, you're different, right? Now, in this path, fits very nicely Adolf Hitler. I'll determine who is worthy of life, right? In this philosophy fits two major errors in our country's history. I'll determine whether the pigment of someone's skin determines whether they're a human being or not, or worthy of freedom or not. Or I will determine whether 10 minutes before someone's born, they're a child. Or not. It's very dangerous. Very, very, very dangerous. And it's all up to the will. And the strongest, the loudest voices get the get the get the power. And if you look at who's moving in the in the culture, look who's trying to gain power and the louder voice. And the other philosophy is, is this. This is where our Lord Jesus Christ is. This is where even Aristotle, and they would say, nature, look at look at nature, look at it, observe it. Truth is outside of you. Conform yourself to the truth. Observe what it means to be a human being. And then follow that, and that's called virtue. And that'll lead you to happiness. One side is control. Once Adolf Hitler lost control, what did he do? Killed himself. Right? All depends on control. Your own will. 
And here, no, we just we follow us. It's truth. It's outside of me. I don't determine it. Very, very important. We have, a, we believe this side. Of it. We have a nature. We have reason. We can observe. We're rational, right? We're part of us. We're part. We're interconnected. We're part of our nature as family. And part of our nature is fatherhood and masculinity and femininity. That's not up to us. It's part of nature. We just observe it. Now, Bishop Olmsted, in writing this document, goes right here and proclaims masculinity. A lot of people are nervous about doing that. He recently released a document. It's great. He released a document at 3 o'clock. At 3.05, there were complaints. It's great. It's great. We're human beings. And the, 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 the larger social unit is built upon masculine and femininity, masculine and femininity and family. And if you look at people, where are their deepest wounds? Family. And a lot of times, father and mother. And a lot of times, father. Right? St. Thomas Aquinas says, natural law. There's a, there's a law to nature. And Rousseau says, there's no law to nature. I determine the law. I'm in charge of everything. It's, it's ridiculous. But Thomas says, natural law is just, it's just the rational creature's participation in the divine law. That God put all this together. And we rationally look at that, we follow it, and that's what makes us happy. That's why the saints are joyful. And uh, those who follow this path it can be a very miserable life because we can just control it ourselves. So Bishop, Bishop writes this document, and literally the, the, the men of the world go crazy. I mean, seriously. I mean, just last week I heard from Australia. They're going to have their first men's conference based on this document. It's been translated to like seven or eight, nine different languages. Great. Great. I gave a retreat on it a few months ago in Honduras. These men were like, oh, yes, yeah, no one's ever told me that. We were, the Pope John Paul II wrote two major documents to women. And the story is, is that these women got together and they prayed and they said, what would be the next step on, the, on that pathway? And these women got together and they said, how about write something for the men? You want to give us something? Give us some holy strong men. Give us what Bishop Olmsted's document calls us, calls us to, to be providers, protectors, and spiritual leaders. And that's what I want to, that's what I want to talk about. Those three things, because if, if we go by our nature, we say, what does it mean to be a man? What is masculine virtue? We're going to be happy. We're going to have integrity. We're going to be who we're made to be, right? That's basically all bishops ask us to do. It's not a rocket science. Um, but, but we have to say, instead of this philosophy here, we say, no, sexuality matters. Masculinity matters. It's not just plumbing. It's not just our own make uh, idea. No, we're spiritually male. We're physically male, we're also spiritually male. And we're called to own that. Just last, uh, just last Saturday, I got home from a trip. I've been planning this trip for like 10 years. I've been a priest 10 years. And me and my classmates celebrate our, our anniversary, so guys, we're gonna do something. And we've been talking about going to this little village in France called Ars for, for years and years and years. That's the village where St. John Vianney served, right? And so we went there. Uh, it's this little place we spent uh, three days there, prayer, and just soaking up uh, a lot of the graces of the last 10 years of our, of our priesthoods, um, and praying for a lot more. But one thing that was interesting, when I went to this little town, John Vianney, the patron saint of all priests, he's, he's a you know, spiritual father of excellence, gave his life at the end of his life, Satan told him, because he would have his experience, Satan told him he stole, he stole 300,000 souls from him. There was only like 800 people in the village. That's the power. That's the power of a man, being a father. And as we prayed there, and I went, I went through there, um, I noticed one thing. He had two confessions. He had one for men, and one for women. Now I'm not telling Father Robert and his renovations to do this. No hanging, probably. But John Vianney, they would say, well, why would he do that? He, he just made distinctions. He said, men are men and women are women. And I, I, you know, in this confessional, I, I speak to the men in one way. And I speak to the women in one way. And I came across this author, and he said, why? Why John Vianney did that? And this is what he said. He said, he heard men's and women's confessions separately because 
The animated universe is sexual. It's not unisexual or bisexual, which are forms of hostility toward the charisms of masculinity and femininity. Difference is a, is a necessary condition for femininity and masculinity. Difference is, is essential, necessary condition for equality. You talk about equality? A lot of times when we talk about equality, we're trying to get rid of difference. That person that called up at 305 was upset that we wrote about them just for a minute. Why? Men are different. That's okay. John Paul wrote about them for a minute. None of the men complained. Right? It's, it's essential. Sexual dignity is not sexist for the same reason that natural law is not sexist. It's, just our, it's our nature. A woman being a woman and a man being a man, they don't play roles unless it's part of the drama of our creation. God has put into us masculinity. It's part of the drama of his creation. Creation doesn't happen. The, the recreation, the, the Continuation of creation, like children, it doesn't happen unless men are men and women are women. Now, and so the creation of man and woman was God's greatest outpouring of perfection. We cannot pretend, we cannot pretend that it was His one mistake. So we should say, "Ah, man, God made me that way." Pope Francis says, "Accept it, accept what God gave, perfect it." Ask God to give you virtue in it. That's all bishops ask us to do. And so to think that our sexuality is mere costuming, as if it hides some authentic asexual nature, is tragically wrong. The women of ours, France, became heroic in their womanhood, and the men were restored to faith, who had lost in men for many years. They became men, because the spiritual father led them. And so I'm not thinking, I'm not going to have two confessions, but I see the reason why he did it. It makes great sense. He would have the men line up and they know, together. And he would speak to them as men. And as a confessor, I could say, it's different. I speak to a feminine soul different than a masculine soul. They're different. It's just the case. If you just look at creation, guys, you know your scripture, Genesis 2 and 3. That's the story of the creation of man, the creation of woman, right? What happens to Adam when he's created? What, is, what does God do? Hey, Adam. Get off your butt and get to work. Name the animals, cultivate the field, you know, get, get to work. What happens to Eve when she opens her eyes? What does Eve see? She sees a person. She sees a person. Adam sees work. And then what about the curses when sin enters the world? What's Adam's struggle? His struggle is around work, the sweat of your brow, the toil. The toil of the earth, right? That's his curse. What's Eve's curse? Relationship. Giving birth is going to be pain. The relationship between you and your husband, you're going to long for him, right? So it all got messed up in sin, right? So if our creation at the beginning, the, the, the roles were different from the beginning, and even the curses were different, we have to kind of go out there and say, yeah, you're right, Lord, man, you've made men different than you've made women. So, into that, Bishop says, now I'm going to start my talk. Bishop says this. There are those in our culture today, however, who do not want to see fatherlessness as unnatural or lamentable. Do not be fooled by those voices. Wishing to erase the distinctions between mothers and fathers, ignoring the complementarity that is inherent in creation itself. So, the one line I want to focus on in this talk is this. Men, your presence and mission in the family is irreplaceable. It's irreplaceable. My dad, who lost his dad at three, at three years old, couldn't replace his father. Sometimes I'll ask a young child in our society, we kind of like to talk that. It takes a village kind of talk. And I'll say, tell me about your mom and dad. In my neighborhood where I'm serving, there's a lot of fatherlessness. And a child will say, my mom is my mom and dad. No. You still need a dad. For the moment I'm not here, I'm a spiritual father for you. But you still need a dad. Right? It's irreplaceable, Bishop says. That is a basic truth. 
It's very, very, very important. And if you look at, if you look at our prisons, who are they full of? Fatherless men, fatherless women. I mean, it's rampant. And our population just grow. So Bishop goes right into that. And he says, men, your presence and mission in the family is irreplaceable. Step up, he says, and lovingly pray. Patiently take up your God-given role. God-given. That is to say, it's in your nature. It's what you're made to be. You can't avoid it. No matter what you think. No matter what Bruce said or so tell you. Your God-given role as protector, provider, and spiritual leader in the home. Now, I worked with Bishop on this doctor. And it was, a, it was one of the greatest projects I've ever worked on. It's his doctor. But he would have, have us read it. And I remember we shared it with one, with one honest woman. <laughs> and she said that terms. She said, this is what we want. She said, my girlfriends always keep saying, like, I hate wearing the pants in the family. This is what we want. We want men to be men. Protector, provider, spiritual leader. Perhaps in order of importance, least to greatest. Protector, provider, spiritual, spiritual leader of your home. Fathers, a father's role as spiritual head of this family must never be understood when I was taken as dominion over others, not as loving leadership and gentle guidance for those who care your fatherhood. My fatherhood, he says, in its hidden and humble way, reflects surely the fatherhood of God. For so many years, there was a kind of a liberal branch in the church who wanted to say, Anything but Father. Oh Lord, oh gracious and kind being, Creator, Father. Jesus said Father more than anything else. My Father and your Father. Right? Jesus says, Do you want to pray? Pray our Father. The healing of that is not ignoring that moment of fatherlessness. It's, it's, and we shouldn't project that on God's eternal fatherhood. We should just let God's fatherhood heal us. Right? So Bishop says, step up, patiently, lovingly, protector, provider, and spiritual leader of the home. Let's just start with Jesus now. How is Jesus protector? What do you think of? I think of the cleansing of the temple. Protecting the house, protecting the house, keeping evil out of it, keeping those who want to use the house for some other reason. Keeping keeping it, protecting. Protecting the relationship between children and their father. That's what happens at the temple. Provider. How is Jesus provider? This is my body. This is my blood. You don't need anything else. If you eat my body, drink my blood, you have life cleaning, I will raise you up. He's not giving out money. He's not giving out clothes. He's giving out his very body. But what does it mean when a father says that? A husband says that? There's a way a husband says that. How is Jesus' spiritual leader? Honesty, right? Take up your cross. Follow me. Every day. Take up your cross. Spiritual leader, no one talks about Satan more than Jesus. That's not some superstition. It's the enemy. He talks about the enemy. The father of lies. He's been a liar from the beginning, he said. That's a spiritual leadership. Bold. I'm going to my father. Where I go, take up your cross, follow me. Spiritual leader. So, what does it look like? That what does that look like for, for me, as a priest? More importantly, in this talk, what does it look like for you guys as men? I want to just throw out this um, this little story. If you, anyone knows Jeff Cave, uh, good Catholic author, and also works on certain masculinity project projects, and uh, he tells this great story. I'll just try to steal it from him. That's what we do. <laughs> um, and he just tells us a story, and he, he says, uh, you know, man, father, husband, you're in bed at night. It's about 2, 2, 2.45 in the morning, maybe. And we do have a nature, and sometimes that nature calls, and so you get up and you go to the restroom. And, you know, peeking, you know, down the hall, everything's quiet. Daughters are in their room, sons are in their room. Your wife is asleep, you go back into your room. Back in the bed, you lay your head on the pillow, and you hear this click. And you know that sound. It 
to your home, to sound of the front door. And you pause. And you distinctly hear uh, the whispering of male voices. What do you do? Do you go to sleep? Do you wake your wife up and ask her to take care of it? <clears throat> the brilliance of Jeff Taylor's story is this. Satan is entering the home. TV, internet, different lives, division in the family. Satan's in. And men are sleeping. Or men are saying, religion stuff, that's up to my wife. Folks, what's more important? The, the, the physical lives, physical well-being of your kids. Because every man boldly says, I'm gonna, get, I'm gonna get my ass out of bed, I'm gonna grab my little little slugger, I'm going after those guys. I'm gonna get my cock, whatever, whatever I have. But I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna sleep while my family's in danger. But gentlemen, what are you doing to protect your family from sin? Jesus says very boldly last week in the gospel, the week before, maybe last week, don't be afraid of those who can kill your body. So in that room, go to bed if they can only kill the body of you and your kids and your wife. Be afraid of the one that can take the soul and send it to hell, the fires of Gehenna. Why would we be so bold to grab a little, little slugger? To protect the physical and be so sluggish and sleep. Men in our culture are sleeping when it comes to the spiritual. To the spiritual. Satan has entered the home, the filth, absolute filth, through TV and internet, through stuff being taught in our schools, hopefully not our Catholic schools. But where is the man saying, I'm making sure that we're living by nature and by virtue? That my daughter's no virtue, that my son's no virtue. Me and my wife are living this virtue. And we're not letting anything enter in. And maybe that's just family division entering in, right? The man must be, must be the, the protector. So that's the first role, the protector, right? In my trip to uh, Ars, France, we stopped over to Normandy. We went to Omaha Beach. And that's, it is powerful. The, just, you know, so many years later, Almost 40, almost 80 years later, it's powerful to stand on that beach and imagine what those men did. The intruder had entered, right? Nazism. Hitler had entered and taken France. He had, there had been an intruder. And these men go to this beach, and you have the beach, you go up a little more, two football fields and a cliff. And they said, one German wrote a book years and years later, he killed them like hundreds of our men. It was such danger, but they were not gonna, they, they, took the, they took the beach, they took the hill, they went, right? The man must be protector, he said, there has been an intruder. In so many of our places, in our homes even, there's been an intrusion of lies about masculinity and femininity, about our destiny. How about the lie that what really matters is money in our jobs, as opposed to our souls, right? And so there's a, there's a there's, man must think, with our rationality, say, well, what are we made to defend, right? If Satan can destroy, this is happening so often, and I say it as a professor and a priest, if he can destroy any young man or any young woman at 12, 11, 12, 13 years old, their understanding of themselves as sexual beings, he can take out their whole family before it could ever happen. That's there's such a crumbling in the family, and I think it's, it's because we let the enemy in. So, gentlemen, think about this. What are you protecting? What do you protect in your family or in your life? What do you protect? Is it merely the physical? Or will you stand before God and say, God, through my prayer, through my sacrifice, through my example, through my instruction, through my discipline, I protected their souls. At the end of my dad's life, he kept repeating, Two phrases. 
Lord, help us to know we're always in your presence. Protect us from the lie that we're not, that you that you're not here. Then he would say, especially mindful of a few who are away from the church and the family, he would just kept praying, bring back the, the strings, bring back the strings. Right? Because in the end, all that matters is the spiritual, the men of our lives. It's all that matters. If your kids are homeless or if they're CEOs, big deal. If they're with God or without God is what matters. The protection that a man offers. Okay, second one, provider. How does a man provide? Well, like Adam, he works his tail off. He works, right? And, and uh, that's important. It's not everything. It's important. And so when you're coming home late and it's tired, you, you know, you're working hard, good. But be with the Lord. Some men can make it tend to escape in that providing and escape from relationality, right? So Adam works hard, but he has to work to be with Eve. Because he's a man. Men are as good as that as women. Right? Right? So there's this virtue that man must, must find, and Christ shows it. He's, he's our example, right? So how does a man provide for his wife? It's very common. I spoke to a, a young person the other day who I, had, who I had in younger years and now wants to get married. It's very common that you'll have a relationship will start and one might have the faith and the other would say, I'm not really into that. And say, for example, the man says, I'm not really into that. And she says, well, I have the faith. And what we often hear is, well, um, I, I, live, I live my faith. He said, well, I respect that. And what I often hear is she says, okay, as long as you respect that. That's, that's the worst answer. Because what, what really pans out over the time in that marriage is what's really central in me, he wants nothing to do with. I saw the film with a couple. They've been married for years, like 20 years great kids, they were, he's a great guy, she's a great gal, and we're trying to work with them, and it comes down to this, at the very end, uh, he never went, he never provided the spiritual, and she always longed for it. That's common, brothers. <laughs> That's common. It's harder for us. Women, yeah, there was a lot more women than men this morning. We, it's, it's harder for us, right? But we, that's also because sometimes we feminized what we think the faith really is. We haven't shown the authentic masculine of the faith. But the man, there's, there's something in a man, spiritually, that a woman's going to long for. And they're not going to be happy until they have it together. And there's a suffering to get there, and it's work. But man, when you have a couple that's united, when he's provided spiritually, as Christ provides for the church, he speaks about his father, and he, gives, he lays down his life. It's all, it's all his, the spirituality of masculinity. It's all there, and when he offers that, then there's happiness. Then there's happiness. Also, I mean, that's all that I can say about providing for his wife. Money and bills, I'm sure you can figure that out. The more important thing is that, man, that, that Christ is never uh, shallow to his bride, the church. The man must be the spiritual leader of his, of his wife and kids. How does a man provide for his daughter? Well, he provides love. There's kind of a some people have a hard time with that, but men traditionally walk their, their daughters down the aisle in marriage. I had a wedding a couple months ago. It was the coolest thing. You might, I don't know if you think it's cool or what, but um, this young woman, uh, they got married young in their, their 20s, but she had a curfew until she got married. And we're talking with them, and, um, and you know, it's just like, usually it's a couple that's like, they're trying to piece together their lives from all these other relationships and then try to make it work and move on and a lot of healing and stuff. I remember being like, wait a minute, you're you're going from your dad's house, your dad has said I love you. And it wasn't like an impressive curfew. It was like, no, we just we love each other. We want to we want to know where we're at at night. We want to sleep under the same house. And so when his dad walked her down the aisle, he said, I've I've loved her. I've protected her. I've led her spiritually. And then this young man, who is from a good family himself, and they get married, it's different. It's different. A man, a man provides that. When a, when a man provides to his daughter authentic fatherly love, she receives something. I can't explain it, 
but it sure is out there. Like, she receives something of this is what authentic love is. And then when whoever comes around and he doesn't have the pure motives, something inside of her says, this isn't what my dad gives me. This isn't, what, this, this isn't authentic love. He knows that. I was a chaplain in high school years ago. It was a great time. Uh, but one morning I was in a classroom and I'm, and I'm teaching, I'm trying to put some, some, some kind of information to these kids. And I get a, you know, the, the sound system goes off the PA. Uh, Father Paul, please come to the, to the nurse office. Father Paul to the nurse office. Yeah, okay. Anyway, I want to finish this point and then go to the nurse office. Like three seconds later, Father Paul to the nurse office. Father Paul to the nurse office. Okay, someone's really nervous. I'm going to get myself down there. And they go, and I'm like, what's going on? And they're like, in the room, there's a girl and she's pregnant. And I'm like, okay. Go in there because no one else is afraid to love her. Let me go in there and just sit with her. And I ended up sitting there with her and her dad. Beautiful conversation. Talked. Dad talked. She talked. At a certain point in the conversation, I said, daughter, as a daughter, and father, I said, What about here? What's this relationship been like? This young girl, 17 years old, honest as can be, could name, could name it when her dad withdrew from her. She's like, like three years ago it happened. She became a woman. It got awkward. His understanding of his role as a man or his understanding of femininity, and he withdrew. And naturally she was made for love and she went and looked for him, right? But it was a beautiful insight. Dad said, I need to be there. I'm still her father. I need to love her as a, as a young woman. And he's a great guy to the baptism. He's a great dad. And their relationship continued. And, they, and kind of he re, refilled the void. And for many guys, it's a beautiful thing to kind of return to that. And that's the virtue. That's the virtue of masculinity that our mission is calling us to. Another time I was working with a young woman at a university, and uh, she's getting into this crazy sorority stuff, and this crazy culture. And, you know, just sadness and confusion and, and at a certain point in the conversation, I said, stop. Tell me about your dad. Where'd that come from? And she said, oh, I've been trying to get that man's love in my whole life. In our nature, in our nature as men, we are made to be providers. And when we don't provide that, there will be suffering. She couldn't say with Rousseau, oh, uh, he's, he's not my dad. I, I decided he's not my dad. In my mind, he's not my dad. So I don't need that anymore. No, no, no. I'm made for that. It's part of my nature. For sons, they want to know what it means to be a man. And every only a, only a man can do that. I <laughs> to tell a lot of the talks. Ladies, you can't give your sons masculinity. You can't comfort your son, coddle your son to man to manhood. He's just gonna grow confused. He needs men. He just does. And, and we find it. We find masculine confusion usually follows masculine absence previously. Right? I had a funeral a few months ago. It was, it was tragic. It was very sad. A 21 year old young dad um, was killed in a car accident. And I'm at the funeral, and there's the one, there's the, not the wife, the girlfriend with this one year old baby. And something moved me at the end, at the, at the graveside. We're about to put his body in the, in the tomb. And there was a cycle in this, in his, in his, in his family, he's an absent father. So you had the, the women sitting here, the dad's kind of away, getting distant. And there's, the, there's this young woman, the one-year-old child, holding this child, trying to figure out what's going to happen in this child's life. And before we put the body in the ground, God said, wait a minute, who's going to be his father? Who's going to step up for this young man? And I can hear the women saying, oh. Thank you, Father. And I said to the men, I said, when, he, when he's 10 years old and he's throwing rocks at the neighbor's house, who's going to tell him not to do that? When he's 15 and he wants to join a, a, a gang, do drugs, who's going to tell him he's, a, he's better? Who's going to tell him he's a man? Who's going to encourage him? If this doesn't happen, the cycle is going to continue. When I grew up in, in New York, we had uh, this little kid who used to come over the house. My mother used to babysit him. His name was Chris. Great kid. You know, he's my younger brother's age. And my mother would babysit him all the time. His, his mom was about 18. And we had him since he was a little kid. And 
I, you know, my mom would change the diapers and he would play with us. He would drop dogs and I'm going to go to work. Dad wasn't there. And as we grew up with this kid, Chris, he, they're different, mom would have different boyfriends. And I remember Chris coming to tell me, yeah, the, you know, so and so, my mom and boyfriend, we came to an apartment and there was this other lady there, there were condoms and da 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 da. And it was, it was tragic for this kid. He never, never had someone just to provide that, say, you're my son. You're good. You're made for good. Be good. Seek virtue. Right? The last thing I heard of Chris, an article in the paper years ago, his street name was Murder. Isn't that the destiny of lack of fatherhood? His street name was Murder. He was a good kid. I love him. I'd love to, I'd love to talk to him today. When I was preparing these notes, I looked him up. I couldn't find him. I don't know where he is. The man must be there. He must provide for the, for the young men. I don't know if you've heard of some of these, these times where guys take their 13, 14-year-old sons out with all of the other men. They go out and they affirm him. They, they commend him as a man. That's important. I do father-son retreats. Camp outs. Those kids will remember I had that time with my dad. And I know a man. And I'm a good man. And I'm made for good men. I follow the line of good men. My dad's funeral. When his friends came, me and my brothers listened. They talked about how he would stand up. It wasn't, it wasn't popular to stand up for unborn children. And a man saying, I never would have been pro life if it wasn't for Jerry Song. We stand up. There's truth. You know? What are the men, what are your friends going to be like at your funeral? What are they going to tell the other men? We should grow up and say I'm part of a strong line of good men. It's important for us. What are our friends like? Finally, the man is a spiritual leader. I said that statement when the couple says, oh, he respects my faith. What he's saying there is, I'm never going to have that intimacy with you. I'm never going to go to that deep place where God is, my soul and your soul. I'm not going to go there. That's, that's what, what authentic marriage has in the center. What authentic masculinity has in the center. That's what authentic priesthood has in the center. There's a version of of shallow priesthood, just as there is a version of shallow uh, fatherhood and family. The father was afraid to the problems, you know, those people. I just, I just want to be a manager. Well, a father could do the same thing in the family. I just want to go to work, right? My work is my love. That's a cowardly excuse for a man who doesn't want to sit with his children and listen to them, hear their hearts. For a man who can't listen to his wife's soul and share his own with her. It's easy to go to work, men and gentlemen. It's easy. Jesus didn't just come to suffer on the cross in a cold way. He looked at the thief. He looked at his mother. He looked at John. And in a sense, we can say he looked at us. He was with us in his work of salvation. So the statistics show if a man converts to the faith, Christian faith, the percentage of times that a woman and the children will follow is like in the 90th, 90 something percent. If a woman converts, the percentage of times that the man and the children convert is like under 5%. If children grow up in a house where mom goes to church and dad does not, he's not a leader. Like, as compared to a, a household where the dad goes to church and mom does go, doesn't go to church, 10 times more likely to go to church on a regular basis because dad was the leader. Guys, no pressure here. But if your kids are going to get to heaven, they'll get to heaven through the body of Christ. Jesus says, if you do not eat my body, do not drink my blood, you have no life within you. And how are they going to get that if they don't regularly come to the, to the altar? If we're praying for some last minute conversion, some father scoops in there, you know, absolves them, throws, throws the body and blood in Christ in his mouth. As a priest, it's been 10 years, let me tell you, it's not common. People die the way they live. If the man is steady, again, guys, no pressure here. 
And maybe if you say, gosh, I've failed at this for years and years and years, okay, great, it's time to just step up and start praying and repairing, praying in reparation, adoring the Lord in reparation, going to man, going to communion in reparation, asking what you receive Jesus to say, Lord, give this to my kids who've fallen away. Or maybe you just die like my dad, say, bring home the strings, bring home the strings. This into the breach movement document and, and, and what continues to happen wants to break into break into the lack of protecting, providing, and leading. And, and stir up John. I started by saying, who is the man? Who is the man in your life that most affects you? And I want to end by saying, who are the men in your life that you most affect? Who are they? Think about that for just a moment. Do you protect them, your actions and words? Do you provide for them? Are you a spiritual leader for them? Do they know your soul? 